had an engineering degree, MBA, went to Ford Motor Company for five years, loved it, but just was itching to be an entrepreneur. So I started my uh, first company with a friend. It actually was sold to a public firm five years later, and I didn't know what to do. I was kind of acting like semi-retired, like some big shot, but I was miserable. And in fact, I became the worst version of a good father, husband, friend. And I realized I didn't have a great purpose that was real clear at that time. And so I started investing, started flipping houses, then flipping waterfront lots, built some houses, did a small subdivision, eventually got into commercial real estate. Fast forward another 10 years, and we have done six funds with our company, Wellings Capital. That was Paul Moore of Wellings Capital. That was Paul's second time on the show, and he is a wealth of knowledge. He's a regular contributor over at Bigger Pockets, and I love reading his, his blogs and his stories. So I hope you do too, so go check that out. But let's get into the show and hear what he has to say about today's market. The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor, and has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time, and that is why we're here together. 90% of the millionaires out there built their net worth with real estate. However, 0% of the billionaires are hands-on managing the real estate assets because there simply isn't enough time. My name is Jake Wiley, and for the past 16 years, I've been investing in real estate, and I've learned a thing or two. But the most important lesson is how to leverage the expertise and time of others to maximize your investment potential. Welcome to the Limited Partner Podcast. All right, welcome partners. This is your host again, Jake Wiley. This week, I'm joined by another returning guest, Paul Moore. Paul has been on the show before, and you know, so to set this in context, we're recording this in mid-February of 2023. The world is changing. You know, it seems like almost weekly. The last time we had Paul, it was a different world altogether. And you know, Paul is a great contributor to Bigger Pockets. He's got a, a really great thought leadership that he's putting out there, and I wanted to bring him back so that we could have additional clarity on what he's seeing in the market, Paul. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here again, Jake. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. Well, Paul, you know, for the benefit of my listeners out there that maybe didn't catch the first show, I'd love to give you a couple minutes here just to give us a high level overview of who you are and how you got to where you are today. All right. Fantastic. Well, I had an engineering degree, MBA, went to Ford Motor Company for five years, loved it, but just was itching to be an entrepreneur. So I started my uh, first company with a friend. It actually was sold to a public firm five years later, and I didn't know what to do. I was kind of acting like semi-retired, like some big shot, but I was miserable. And in fact, I became the worst version of a good father, husband, friend. And I realized I didn't have a great purpose that was real clear at that time. And so so I started investing, started flipping houses, then flipping waterfront lots, built some houses, did a small subdivision, eventually got into commercial real estate. Fast forward another 10 years, and we have done six funds with our company, Wellings Capital. Well, that's awesome. It's a great story. And I mean, I think we may even have to have another conversation <laughs> to talk about this whole purpose thing. I deal with that on a regular basis. And I know a lot of my listeners have probably heard this, but you know, I started this journey a year ago or so. I've been in real estate for 16 years, but I was thinking I was going to be a syndicator and really dug into it, spent a bunch of money and kind of got to the point where like, you know what, that's not what I want to do. Like, I, I don't want to do that. And, you know, we've been kind of unpacking it. And I think that becoming an incredible limited partner, somebody that's got flexibility to go and invest in a bunch of different things is really where my passion is and, you know, hence the show. But I think you've probably got something to offer <laughs> on this finding your purpose thing that we should discuss later. Yeah, let's do it. Well, Paul, let's dive right in. You know, like as I kind of alluded to in the intro of the show, the market is changing very fast. The economy is in a really strange place. We've still got low unemployment, but interest rates are going up. We're seeing debt completely frozen. Give me your perspective on where we are and what should we be looking out for right now? Yeah. So I was in my church lobby on Sunday and the largest real estate and most successful, I would think, real estate developer that I have ever met made a beeline for me. And he's like, hey, can we grab lunch? I'm like, how about Tuesday? He said, how about Monday? <laughs> so we got together yesterday and he was telling me about this development deal he's working on. I mean, he's working on several, but like one of the latest he's had for a year in the works, he's selling, he's already got pre-contracts for a thousand lots out of 8,000 to this one very large national developer. And that's, but that's not what he wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about the fact that his bank, after decades of close friendship working together, came back at him like with claws out recently and told him, you know, if you want to 
keep borrowing money from us. You're going to have to do this, that, and the other. And it was unreasonable. And he's like, what do I do? I mean, he's like, you know, he's got a three generation development company. He's asking me, you know, and I'm thinking, well, first of all, he probably asked the wrong guy, but that's not the point. The point is banks are acting weird. I know another large, well-known syndicator who their debt is not going to be renewed this year, even though, even on properties that are going great, multifamily properties, because the holder of the debt, the lender, I should say, he's got bad deals in the office realm, which has nothing to do with his multifamily deals. But the cash drain over there on the office side is messing with their ability to fund anything. And I read today that a company, I think it's Brookfield in LA, is defaulting on two huge office loans, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And so this is a weird time. And like you said, it's a time when lenders, for no apparent reason that would be obvious to any of us at least, might not be renewing loans. I heard about another lender that had a file folder full of performing loans that are he's not going to renew this year. So I'm telling my son, who's a younger real estate investor, obviously, I'm like, man, you need to be ready for the potential that your loans might not get renewed this year, even though you're doing fine. So that's some of what's going on at a high level. And if you want, we can talk about what LP investors might want to look out for. Yeah, you bring up a great point. I've actually written a couple articles on this myself, is that the office market is so tenuous right now. And, you know, there's statistics and depends on who you believe, but between 20 and 30% of the office stock out there is effectively obsolete. And that's because like eight foot ceilings, it was built in the seventies, like nobody wants to work in that space anymore. Now that health is a thing, like people have a choice to go to their office. I just don't want to do that. Those offices are going empty. A lot of people out there, especially in the community, and I'm really glad you brought up this point about office affecting other assets is that, you know, think, well, I don't invest in offices. Thank goodness, right? Like I've been in multifamily, I've been in self-storage, like you pick it, like office has never been my cup of tea. But I think that there is a cliff that's coming and you just alluded to it, that the impact of, let's say 20 to 30% of these things will never be in office again. So it's got to be something else. Yet, if you think about the average life cycle, any of these real estate investments, let's call it five to seven years as a hold. Those buildings that are now obsolete were purchased in the last decade. It's come and due. And it's not like they've, you know, well, you know, I'm sure a lot of them, some of them have been owned for forever. But that's just not the way the market works. Therefore, we've got this office that was capitalized and, you know, let's call it even be generous and say 10 years ago. And uh-huh. it's effectively worthless. Like the banks are going to be the, like, generally there's enough equity in these deals to like hold them off, but the, the banks are going to take a walloping on these offices. And, yeah. you know, I think that like what that now you're seeing in one development, you're seeing in a multifamily, there is a real issue with one asset class that's actually potentially bringing the rest of them down. Do I have that right? You got it exactly right. I think it's ironic that, you know, while industrial has come roaring back and retail has even come mm-hmm. back, especially certain types of retail, you know, office could be sinking. I don't want to say the whole ship, but a lot of ships. Yeah. Like you, I've been privy to some interesting conversations and names, but you know, we've got some really large players out there that are raising their hand and they're asking the question, like, is, you know, is office going to impact us? You know, are we going to get, you know, got performing assets? Like, are we going to get hammered over the head because, you know, the office market? And I think the reality is, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, right. It is. Well, let's shift gears. Let's talk about, you know, you alluded to this too. What should LPs be looking for in this current market, right? Because we're not the operators. We're not hands-on with these assets. We've got to be yeah. really careful because we're trusting an intermediary with our right. money. Yeah, I would say so, here are some things we're looking for right now. Because we're a fund, we're operating, you know, we're trusting the operators, I should say, the syndicators at the asset level to make the best choices. And so here's some of the things we're looking for. One, low leverage is something to look out for. Wait a minute. Did he say low? Yeah, I said that. Low leverage is a great thing in general, except when there's preferred equity in line ahead of you, meaning you've got leverage, you've got debt. Let's say it's only 50% instead of 75, but then you've got pref equity up to 85 and you're coming in as the 15% equity. Well, that preferred equity is in the capital stack ahead of you. So that's something to look out for. And of course, I was a little tongue in cheek there. Of course, we want to look out for high leverage as well, but that's not happening as much right now as we just alluded to five minutes ago with banks tightening up. Another thing to look out for would be high skin in the game. Wait, that's another good thing. Well, except when it's the sponsor's upfront fees that are paying that high skin in the game. And again, there's nothing wrong with them using that as skin in the game, but I want to see other cash from the sponsor in the game. I want to have them, you know, have a real pain 
a real personal hurt that is going to clobber them if things go bad, just like it's going to clobber me as an LP investor. Operating expense ratios below industry norms. We saw a deal the other day that had multifamily in the high 20s, like 28% operating expense ratio. And there are occasional deals out there, like, you know, let's say in the short-term rental market or something like that, or even in the midterm rental market where that could happen. But honestly, we left that deal right into the circular file on the floor because what we've heard and I hope this isn't true, but Jake, I've actually heard that syndicators actually back down their operating expense ratios to get to the IRR for investors that they wanted, the investors want to see. I would hope that's not true, but again, tongue in cheek, I think it might be. Reversion cap rates much lower than the current cap rate. Sure, that could happen, but if you're counting on that to make the deal work, I think that's a little speculation. You know, counting on going back to a 4% cap rate just because it was there a year ago, year and a half ago, counting on value add upgrades to get there. Yeah, that can work. We are investing in a deal right now in Henderson, Nevada, where that is going to work. But let me just clarify. I mean, this is with a sponsor who has a couple decades doing this repeatable process with I believe, you know, close to 100% success. I would look really carefully. Again, you want to look carefully at the sponsor, and that's an example of it there. And I'm not saying the reversion cap rate is going to be lower than the current one. What I am saying is I think their value add upgrade program will work, but they don't all work. An example of that right now is in my next warning, and that would be inflated rent growth assumptions. Look, just because rent growth has been, I'm just making this up, 18% a year for three years in a row in a certain market in the middle of Arizona, does it mean you should assume 15 to 18% the next three years? I think we all know that, but you know, that bias, you know, that confirmation bias, you really want to invest in this deal. So you believe that faulty reasoning and that can cause a lot of trouble. I saw the other day, this was in the news, this large, very large syndicator. They have six and a half or seven and a half billion in multifamily assets. And they've only just, I mean, they've only been in business a very short time. These guys are very young. This is in the news. I'm not making this up. And they have to get 50% NOI growth just to break even because they stretched their assumptions too far. And they're in markets where they were assuming 25% rent growth from these value adds. Instead, they've actually had a rent decrease instead during the last year. And again, these rent growth assumptions, Brian Burke, who I know that you guys love on this show, this is a quote straight from Brian. He said this in November, five months ago now, there were 50 out of 151 major markets with double digit rent growth forecasted for 2023. Now a forecast by the same economist predicts double digit rent growth in exactly zero markets in 2023 and growth above 9% in only three markets. In other words, nine point something percent in only three markets out of 151. I think that's something to worry about. Another thing to look at, we just saw this the other day, mismatched rent comps. We were looking at a 1968 built asset that was showing comps from 2008 and 2021. Maybe they thought investors wouldn't catch this, or maybe they were discounting. I don't think they were, or maybe that's the only comps they had to go on. If you're looking at deals, just be really careful about that. And here's one that I wouldn't have thought of, but one of my partners at my company mentioned this, strategically delayed capital calls. Huh? Well, that might seem a little nerdy, Jake, but it's really important to know that if you're worth with a syndicator or a fund manager that's calling their investor capital in tranches, that they can actually, I mean, I don't think that's often the best investor experience, but it can be worse than that. Many use subscription lines of credit to leverage the LP commitments without calling the LP money, which means let's say you've committed to invest $100,000. You only get 20,000 called this month. Well, let's say four months from now, you're hoping to get the rest called they use a subscription line of credit instead to actually delay your capital call, which means you'll be in the deal a shorter time. It'll drive up your IRR, but lower your actual ROI in the end. And so that's just something else I want to just warn people to look out for in this crazy scenario that we're in right now. So that's what I got, Jake.
Well, that was chock full of incredible information. And I think the, you know, as we think about the marketplace and really a lot of what we're talking about is the assumptions that go into the deal, you can look at them in kind of a microcosm. So let's just say over the past three years, you know, let's call the increase has gone up by 20%. Like when you compound that, right? Like that's probably over a hundred percent rent growth in three years, right? So if you look at it one year over the other, it kind of is like, oh, okay, that makes sense, right? Like that's the growth rate. But when you right. look at that in real dollars, right? Let's just say in a, an apartment was renting for you know, $1,000 three years ago, it's renting for $2,000 now. Do we think in three years that it's going to be renting for four? Like some things just don't make sense when you put it in a little bit of context. And I think that you right. know, what you're bringing up is spot on is that, yes, it's easy to kind of look at these things and say, oh, that makes sense. But you got to look at it in the big picture. And then, you know, one of the other points that you brought up is some of these younger syndicators that have been growing very fast and they yeah. make me very nervous. And the reason is that, yes, they've had a good track record. And I think that one of the things we've seen touted is these investor returns is like they've actually gone full cycle on deals in three to five years. And like, if you actually think about it, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because that's not the investment thesis going in. But the market over the past couple of years has just said like, hey, look, this is super lucrative. We've got to a point where we can go ahead and sell this deal and move on to the next one, get our investors their full return back. That's a really small window, right? I mean, they really haven't gone full cycle and full investment thesis on a lot. And right. there is a lot of pressure, especially when you're growing and there's a lot of pressure to grow very fast that, you know, the only way to do the next deal is to do a deal, right? Like you have to keep doing deals because you're collecting these fees and you're taking these fees and you're recycling them. And that's what's paying for all the people. And when right. you've got groups that are in these high growth modes, like they're taking that, those deal fees and they're you know paying their people. And then they're like pumping up their next one. And mm -hmm. to your point, like when those assumptions don't work and now you're talking about a 50% NOI increase year over year, like that can't work. And that will unravel very fast. Everybody's growing like a weed, like it works. But like when that catches you, it catches you like immediately. Yeah. Well, I love your show because I know that your listeners are getting incredible value because you're on the same side of the table as them. And I mean, I think this is why this is such an important podcast, Jake. Well, Paul, I appreciate it. And it's sometimes it feels like it's all doom and gloom, but I think that there's always opportunities out there. And yeah. I kind of want to like pivot, right? Because we've talked about like, you know, maybe you should just keep your money in your pocket, but I actually, I should probably change the intro to, you know, talk about where real wealth is created and it's created in downturns, right? And mm -hmm. there's like the opportunity to grow. So like you can't want to just blindly hand your money over to somebody that's been doing this for a while because they can use minute assumptions throughout their, you know, their forecast and make the numbers work. And they all yeah. look small and they all look quasi reasonable, but right. you know, there are going to be opportunities. And I think that like you've alluded to it kind of indirectly is that there will be deals that will not be refinanced and they're going to have to do something with them. They don't go away, right? Like in its apartment right. full of people that's still paying rent, it's going right. to go somewhere, but it may not stay with the current owner and how yeah. that deal gets exited, you know, TBD, but these are the times where there's opportunities and there's going to be real players out there that have been sitting on mounds yeah. of cash to deploy, yeah. to get into these places. But let me get your opinion. Where do you think yeah. the opportunities are? So in late September 2008, a year which will live in infamy, Warren Buffett pivoted and he bought in $5 billion of Goldman Sachs. Oh man, if you, I mean, now we can look back at it differently, but remember we're in a rear view mirror situation. At that moment, he looked like he could have been flushing $5 billion down the eternal drain, but uh, he bought in Pref Equity. And I would really encourage people, I don't really love being in the last seat in a pref equity deal where there's like two tiers of equity, but it's a great time to be in pref equity right now. I would just say that. And he got pref equity and he made a whole lot of money from that $5 billion investment in uh, Goldman Sachs. Howard Marks is one of my favorite authors. He wrote Mastering the Market Cycle and the most important thing. And Howard Marks was being interviewed that same time in October of 2008 by a reporter. And he said, yeah, we're buying up all the assets we can right now. 500 million a week is what our budget is to buy up assets. And she said, wait, what you're selling, you mean, right? He said, what? No, we're buying. If not now, when? And the point is, 
it is a great time when things are going really bad. You know, you've heard blood running in the streets and fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. It's really true. Now, I don't think we're clearly not at that point yet, but wouldn't this be a great time to be stashing away, you know, and preparing, you know, your cash to be ready to invest in deals like that? I think clearly, I don't know when, but certainly by the third, probably the fourth quarter of this year, we're going to see some deals hitting the market. I mean, there's already some out there where we might be investing in one that already fell out from a syndicator that lost it. And if you can buy that for 50 cents on the dollar from the bank, like you said, it's an operating business. Oh man, what an opportunity. Yeah. And I, I, one point that I think we should make is that there might be an intent to kind of sit on your hands and wait for these opportunities. But the other side of the coin is like, you got to have your checkbook out ready to go when they show up because yeah. somebody's going to scoop them up. And these things move fast. They move quietly. And uh -huh. generally what's happening is that, you know, behind closed doors, these things are getting brokered. And if you yeah. have an opportunity and you're looking at one of these things, it can't be, well, let me just beat this thing to death. Like if you're working with the right partner, and I think you've yep. done a great job of highlighting this, that knows what they're doing and they've done this before and they see the opportunity and they bring the deal, like you got to be ready to go. I mean, yep. you're just going to pass you by. So it is kind of a tough on one side to be like, well, I don't want to catch the falling knife while things are falling. But yep. at the same time, like there are a lot of performing assets out there that are you know, are going to change hands and they're going to change hands at great deals. Yeah. And I want to be really clear. I wish I'd have said this earlier and I know you would agree. I don't want to see anybody lose a dollar. I mean, I feel bad for those guys, the six and a half billion dollars guys, investors, you know, I feel bad for anybody and our friends, our competitors, whatever. I hope nobody loses on this and there is a way out and that way out would be quickly dropping interest rates real soon. But you know, History tells us that it's probably not different this time. Trees don't grow to the sky and there's going to be some chopped down really soon. And one thing I think I'd be remiss is, can you explain this pref equity piece a little bit, right? Because we talk about being a limited partner and having a passive yeah. piece of the pie, but pref equity is a different slice. Yeah. So of course you've got debt and you've got lenders who would have been in possible loaning 73, 75% LTV or LTC in this case, actually. And then that syndicator might be looking for 25 to 27% equity. Well, now they're having a hard time scraping together the equity because that's slowed down. But now the banks come back and sometimes at the last minute say, whoops, we're only going to give you a 50% LTC loan. What now? Well, this is a great deal. They still want to do the deal. And it really is. And it checks those boxes we talked about earlier. Well, PREF equity can be a solution. Preferred equity that has current cash flow that goes behind the debt in the capital stack and in front of the regular LP common equity. And this would be equity, you know, that gets a, let's say, current cash flow of 8%, you know, right off the bat. And then the other equity holders, they get cash flow if there's any left. And they also can be negotiated to pay off sooner. Like if there's a sale of an asset and it's less than what they hoped, well, the pref equity people after the lender would get paid before the common equity. And it's not always that way, but it can be that way. So some of these deals right now are actually penciling better than the common equity deals. Sometimes an honest penciling of a common equity deal these days might look at like eight to 11% where these pref equity can have current cash flow of let's say 8%. And then sometimes a limited upside of six or eight more percent, getting it to a 14 to 18% total coupon. And so those can look really good. The downside for pref equity, there's a few. One is you don't get the unlimited upside. In other words, they're capped at, let's say, 14 to 16% total, just as an example. But in times like this, Buffett and others would say, that's right where I want to be. Well, thank you for that. Like, I think it was very helpful. And some of my LPs out there have seen that before, but I think it's a great educational point that I wanted to make sure that we hammered home. Well, Paul, this has been an incredible conversation as they always are. And thank you coming on, agreeing to come on quickly and give your thoughts on the current marketplace. But is there anything else that you'd like to share that you feel like would make this episode complete? No, I mean, I think we covered a lot in a short time and I would love to come back and talk about purpose and life and bigger picture stuff whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'll be ready very soon. Well, Paul, thank you again so much for being on the show. Thanks, Jake. It's been great. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I'd actually love for you to contribute to a future episode. If you have a question you'd like answered or a topic or a guest to bring on the show, 
please email me at jake at thelimitedpartner.com. Now I realize there's a lot of lingo that's thrown around on these shows, so I've created a cheat sheet for you with the top 26 terms that come up most often. Head on over to thelimitedpartner.com forward slash lingo for the list. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time.